Great. Um, so we, we're, we're at a CEO summit. Many of you folks in the room are founding CEOs, and many of you have been hired to come in as a CEO. And we get a lot of questions about you know, what's the right partnership between founders and, and the rest of management. And I think probably the best example that I've seen in the Valley in the last uh, decade or so is a partnership between Reid Hoffman and Jeff Wiener to really drive LinkedIn. Jeff uh, left Yahoo and was hanging out as an EIR and joined LinkedIn in 2008 and saw it all the way through a $26 billion acquisition by Microsoft and he's still running the company today, which all things considered is not bad for a little arch major, Vinod. So we'll welcome Jeff on board and thanks a lot here. <laughs> So Jeff, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Be here. So you're sitting around figuring out your next move. How did you hear about the LinkedIn opportunity? So uh, I heard about it uh, first from uh, a partner at Greylock. Greylock was one of the uh, earliest investors in LinkedIn. I think it was Series B. And a buddy of mine who I'd worked closely with at Yahoo, uh, James Slavitt, had become a partner at Greylock. David Z was on the board, was very close to Reed, as was Anil. Uh, they're all still close. And uh, Reed and the board had decided they were going to be making uh, a change at the top. They had brought in uh, a professional CEO prior to me. I wasn't the first. Uh, really good guy named Dan Nye. And a lot of mutual respect. Uh, between Reed and Dan, but uh, they had set it up in a way that uh, was a little bit uh, suboptimal. <laughs> so for those that don't know, I guess that would be the euphemistic way of putting it. Uh, Reed uh, was the founder of the company, was the first CEO, founding CEO, largest shareholder, chairman of the board, hired Dan as the CEO, and then Reed took on the title of president of product, reporting to Dan, who then reported to Reed as the chairman of the board and the largest <laughs> shareholder. So what could possibly go wrong in that scenario? And it was despite all their best intentions, because like I said, uh, they got along really well, and Dan's a, a great guy. But it just created, you know, the, the founder casts such a long shadow, right? It just is what it is. So um, at any rate, they decided to make a change, and uh, uh, a couple of different partners, James and David, uh, while I was in EIR at Greylock, asked if I would have any interest in helping read out. And I thought um, helping, I'm putting in quotes, would mean I would use, so I was doing uh, dual stints. I was at uh, Greylock and Excel at the same time. You can't mention other venture firms at this conference sorry, more sorry. than twice. Two, two, okay. all right, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> VC firm uh, who yeah. I shall not name. Exactly. And um, uh, they were great. They allowed me to do it simultaneously and that enabled me to gain broader exposure. And I was doing Greylock two days a week, Excel two days a week. Sorry. Really? I was doing one <laughs> firm two days a week and another firm two days a week. And it was all about Coastal anyway. I just thought about Coastal all the time. Now you got it. <laughs> and so I thought uh, by helping Reed, uh, I would just use the two days a week at the G firm. Earlier, <laughs> or earlier named firm. <laughs> and. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday, I ended up, uh, David Z said you should go spend some time with Reed. I said, sure. And he uh, invited me over to his house. And I was sitting in a, a LinkedIn beanbag chair with all the in logos and like in words like innovate and inspire. And Reed's up at his desk and he's like, so I've got a list uh, of names, two lists. There's uh, full-time CEOs and interim CEOs and you're the only name on both lists. So what do you say? And I was like, what? I, I thought I was just going to help you out a couple of days a week. He said, no, 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 that's not the way this is going to work. And so we ended up spending, Reed estimates, uh, as much as 30 hours together over the next probably six to eight weeks. And uh, How did he convince you? Because he'd had a footfall right before you. Hmm. How did you get comfortable that it wasn't going to happen again? What, what parameters did you set? So that's a fantastic question. So I'll come back to the very specific parameters because he did two things. And for those in the, in the room who are ultimately going to make a similar transition, I think these were the two things that really differentiated the approach. But those 30 hours together uh, were really meaningful and I think very atypical. I think uh, normally when you're hiring in a situation like that, 
you're conducting interviews. Mm -hmm. You interview the candidate, and maybe you, you go through two, maybe three interviews with the same person, but I had never heard of a situation where you spend 30 hours with the, the key decision maker, and that's, I think, a testament to how thoughtful Reed is and the way he does things. And this was not an interview process. This was relationship building, mm -hmm. and we were getting a chance to get to know one another and make sure that uh, there was a mutual fit. And we had already met prior to this process, and I think there was a lot of mutual respect and admiration. And I can tell you that, you know, Reed was one of the reasons I wanted to join LinkedIn. Not, it wasn't in spite of Reed. Right. Uh, but the two things that, that he did that I think really helped set us up to be successful and provided the foundation uh, were both based on learning what not to do. The night before, so I came in as interim president, and despite the fact we had both agreed I was gonna have the responsibilities of a CEO, I came in as interim president. I had left Yahoo only a few months prior. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the best of times and some very challenging times, and it was invaluable and I learned a lot, but I wasn't sure if I was burned out on operations or burned out on Yahoo. We had just, my wife and I had just had our first uh, daughter, so I wasn't prepared to make a longer term commitment. So I agreed I would do it interim, and as long as they would be open to having me do it full time, if that would make sense. And Reed said, open to having you do it interim, as long as you're open to doing it full time, if it made sense. And so we, we shook hands and said, absolutely. Night before I started, I called him, and I said, so how is this gonna work? I'm gonna join as interim, you're still gonna have the title of CEO. Which decisions should I make, and which decisions are you gonna make? And he said, without any hesitation, that's easy. It's your ball, you run with it. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, 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 I just went through this. I'm not gonna make the same mistakes again. So you're gonna make the decisions. And as if that wasn't enough, this is, again, a testament to how smart Reed is. Over the first, let's call it 10 weeks or so, uh, that I was at the company, Reed physically removed himself from the offices for about eight weeks conferences, travel, vacation time, recognizing that no matter what we explained to people, if people disagreed with what I was gonna do, or uh, were just looking for the founder's input, they would reflexively go to him, no matter how we set it up. Right. And so by virtue of removing himself from the situation, he enabled me to create that kind of connective tissue with the company. There were 338 people when I joined, December of 2008 and it, it made all the difference in the world. The execs that reported to Reed before you joined, how did you interface with them and how many of them survived and how many of your own people did you bring in? Survived, like a game of corporate survivor. Uh, well, you're a Yankee fan. So I am a Yankee good. fan. They're having a great, any Yankee fans on the audience? I can't see who you are, but I'm. That's Keith. Oh, Keith, I didn't know. That's right, he's a big <laughs> New York sports fan. Knicks too, very painful, yeah. <laughs> okay, back to so, Coastal. That's all about us. <laughs> can't mention any sports teams. Uh, so I thought it was really important rather than uh, make snap decisions about talent that I spend time getting to know the folks and um, learning uh, as much as I possibly could. And that's what I did. So I uh, made the decision when I first joined I was going to meet with every one of the 338 people. Uh, maybe not 338 one-on-ones, but uh, certainly one-on-ones with my directs, certainly one-on-ones with their directs, skip levels, and then uh, brown bag lunches. We call them brown bag lunches uh, between 10 and 15 people at a time cycling through every team at the company, and then deep dives on every major product and every major business line. Then could start to assess the mm -hmm. situation and um, make sure we had the right team in place for what we wanted to accomplish. And so at the time, uh, in those earliest days, uh, I don't know that we made any changes within several months, uh, made a, a few key changes. And over the next couple of years, uh, we rotated a, a good chunk of the team. Um, today, uh, the CFO remains the same, uh, the head of sales remains the same, uh, but for the most part, uh, everyone else is different. That's great. Now, uh, anyone see Jeff on Oprah? No, just my wife. As I was... Anyone here watch Oprah? Same hand went up twice. So anyways. 
If you haven't seen it, it's actually great. And uh, Jeff talks about his unique leadership style. It's called compassionate management is what he des described it as. Tell us a little bit about that and how you see, see that as a competitive advantage for LinkedIn. Yeah. So managing compassionately, uh, take a step back. So in terms of uh, classical definitions, uh, compassion is putting yourself in the shoes of another person, uh, seeing the world through their lens or perspective for the sake of alleviating their suffering. Within a corporate environment, I think suffering is too high a bar, and you're going to be in situations when you're in a position to alleviate suffering, because people do suffer. But um, to me, it's about helping people uh, to achieve objectives, helping people to be more successful. It's important to draw a distinction between compassion and empathy. And this was one of the most important lessons I learned uh, within this area. And in Western society, we have a tendency to use the two interchangeably and synonymously. And the difference is em empathy is feeling what another living thing feels. So compassion, in a sense, is empathy plus action. It's uh, a more objective form of empathy where you maintain enough space between you and the other person where you can actually do something about the way that they're feeling, not just feeling what they feel. And the Dalai Lama, uh, which is where I learned this through a book called The Art of Happiness, which I highly recommend, uh, I think uh, illustrates this in a really powerful way. If you're walking along a, a mountainous trail and you come across someone and they're being crushed with a boulder on their chest, the empathetic response would be to feel the same sense of crushing suffocation and that would render you helpless. You wouldn't be in a position to be able to do anything about what they're going through. The compassionate response would be to recognize that they can't breathe, that they, they're suffering, and then to do everything within your power to remove the boulder from their chest and alleviate their suffering. So that's empathy versus compassion. In a work environment, we all have a tendency to be egocentric. It's not just in a work environment, it's in life. It's human nature. We're wired that way. We see the world through our own perspective and it helps keep us safe and protected and, and make critical decisions based on our own experiences. But when you experience conflict or friction with another person, which we all do all the time because we're human beings, whether it's work or elsewhere, the natural knee-jerk tendency is to assume nefarious intention. How could this person possibly disagree with, with uh, me, you? Uh, maybe they're ignorant to the situation or they're political and they're out to undermine us or uh, who knows. And it turns out in those moments, what can really create a lot of value is stepping out of your own perspective, becoming a spectator to your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional, which is really difficult. And in those moments, putting yourself in the other person's shoes to understand what they're going through, why they're responding the way that they are. Why are they getting angry? Why are they getting defensive? Why are they on the attack? And more often than not, it may have nothing to do, especially if you're in the right kind of environment, it has nothing to do with nefarious intention. They may not understand what you're saying and feel vulnerable in front of the team and don't want to cop to that or admit it. You may have said something that triggers them based on an event that took place long before you ever met them. They may be having a bad day, which happens to everyone. And if you take the time to recognize that, you can then do a better job of forging a connection in that moment and trying to achieve a shared objective versus go at one another. <clears throat> now you asked why that can create value within an organization. The larger your company, the more people are working at that company, the more tension there's gonna be, the more conflict you're gonna experience. Now imagine every time you're having that conflict, other people within the company are having conflict. And every time that conflict goes unresolved, and it's going to unresolve a lot, you're leaving meetings frustrated or angry, you're going back to your respective teams and then you're complaining about the other person, the other team and the way they're going about things and what they want to accomplish and how they're going about it the wrong way. And that manifests and compounds. Multiply that through hundreds of people, if not thousands within a company and all of those interactions over time, days, weeks, months and years and you end up in a climate where people are navigating politics more than they're focused on achieving a shared set of objectives or mission. When you get this right, when people are managing compassionately, when they're looking out for the other person, when you're trying to achieve shared objectives, not assuming nefarious intention, you create trust. That trust becomes the foundation, if not a bedrock, for shorthand. You can move that much faster. And in my opinion, the ultimate value of a company is determined by the speed and quality of its decision making. So when you're on the same team, you can make decisions that much faster. 
higher quality decisions too. So I don't think this is just the right thing to do and the, uh, the right way to treat other human beings, and I think it is, it's a virtuous objective. It also creates competitive advantage because I guarantee you that's not the way most companies are operating. How do you scale that from when you were at LinkedIn? When you started LinkedIn, you said 338 people. What do you have now? 12,000. 12,000. How does that scale? That's a great question. So it starts with codification and making sure that everyone that is on your team, everyone who's going to be joining your company, understands not only what it is you're trying to accomplish, but how you're trying to accomplish it. And there's companies that don't even spend the time to codify the what. Right. They don't necessarily say, this is the stated mission. This is the stated vision. These are the strategic objectives. These are our target audiences. These are our operational priorities. These are the measurable goals. A lot of companies don't go to the trouble of defining the what. That's critical. But so is the how, the culture and the values in which you're going to operate. For us, culture is the collective personality of our organization. It's not only who we are, it's who we aspire to be. And we want about codifying the, the cultural dimensions. There's five cultural dimensions. And then values are the first principles upon which we make day-to-day -day decisions. We have six values at the company. Once your culture and your values are in place, it's not just enough to put them up on the wall and distribute those laminated cards that people put in their wallets or the mouse pads. And those can be helpful only insofar as the leadership of the company is walking the walk every day and hiring against it and onboarding against it and developing against it, and a LinkedIn evaluating performance against it. You give a great analogy about pitching and baseball when it comes to managing people. Mm. Love for you to share that with the audience here. Got to check on how many baseball folks we have in the audience because they're right. how many baseball? Fans how many baseball fans any, do any we have? People understand. Okay, cricket. Uh. <laughs> Seriously, man. Global, global world. So look at you. All right. So culturally compassionate. sensitive. <laughs> compassionate. <laughs> so. So um, uh, I was asked on uh, a stage at a, a fireside chat for a, a CEO of a pretty well-established company within the Valley. Once a year, he brings his leadership team together. He interviews another CEO. And every year, he asks inevitably the same question. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned as CEO? And unbeknownst to me at the time, I gave an answer. And afterwards, he said, it's interesting. You may have used different words. But every single CEO I've interviewed over eight years has said the exact same thing. Hmm. So the sports metaphor that I use is leaving the pitcher in the game for too long. So for the baseball fans, potentially for the cricket fans, uh, that refers to a dynamic in baseball where uh, you've got a pitcher, and this gets even more challenging for a pitcher that has established success. You have a pitcher, and they're throwing, and it's a nine-inning game, and for the first few innings, they're doing great. As the game goes on, their arm starts to tire. And you can see it because despite the fact they may still be winning the game, uh, the other team is starting to hit the ball harder. They're getting the bat on the ball, and they may not have been doing that as easily earlier on in the game. And the manager will come out of the dugout to ask the pitcher what's going on. Say, how you doing? And what do you think the pitcher says, particularly a star pitcher? What do you think the pitcher says pretty much every time the manager comes out and asks, how are you doing? Good, great, fine. And if they've been around for a while, go sit down. <laughs> in all seriousness, go sit down. You'll see it. Sometimes they are, go sit down. I got this. I got this. I've been in business now. It's hard to say out loud. I've been doing this for 26 years. Uh -oh. Not one single time in 26 years has anyone that I've worked with ever come to me and said they couldn't do their jobs. Not once. It's not their job to say that. It's my job as the manager. Just like it's the guy coming out of the dugout's job to evaluate how effective the pitcher is going to be at that point in the game. But far too often, we have a tendency to leave the pitcher in the game too long. And if you leave that manager in a critical role for too long when they're in over their heads, inevitably, bad things are going to happen. And we do this because more often than not, we're fearful. We're fearful of how that individual is going to react. We're fearful um, as to how their team's going to react. We're fearful as to whether or not we're going to be able to replace them in a short enough period of time where business can continue to build. We're fearful of what people are going to think of us by virtue of making a difficult decision. And if, if it's not fear, it may be uh, wishful thinking. We're optimistic that they're going to be able to turn it around somehow magically. They'll get it going. 
and we try to rationalize it away because we don't want to have to make that hard decision. One of the worst things you can do in that situation is to leave that person in a role where they're in over their heads. It's bad for their team. Team's gonna underperform. It's bad for you because it undermines your credibility because trust me, the team knows that the manager's not getting it done. It's bad for the individual because they're suffering. They're in over their heads. They lose their sense of self and self-esteem. You've probably all seen it. Someone who would assert themselves around the leadership table who's in over their head and they start to become a shadow of their former self. And it's bad for their family because they're taking that energy home with them. When you've, made the, when you've tapped the pitcher out, what percentage of the time have they, the person come back to you and said thank you? Uh, pretty much every time, but it's not at first. It's, it's, it's almost <laughs> never at first. But almost every time to a person, it's not just thank you. It's that changed everything for me. I didn't realize how bad things were, and I'm so much happier as a result. By the way, just because you identify the fact that they're not doing their jobs, it doesn't mean you're transitioning them out you know, within a few weeks. As a matter of fact, that's, at least for me, that's not best practice. The best practice is once you've identified the fact they're underperforming, sitting down with them and having an open, honest, constructive discussion about where the bar is set, where they're performing, and then making a commitment to them, you're gonna do everything within your power to get them at or above the bar in a very specifically defined period of time. And throughout that time, you're working together on this and you're coaching them and you're letting them know where it's working and where it's not working. And to the extent it appears it's not gonna work, then you transition them. Ideally to a different role within the organization they're better suited for, but potentially exactly to your point, to a different role outside the company. How long is that evaluation period usually? No cookie cutter. Depends on the person, depends on the role, depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, there have been situations where it's uh, a few months. There's been situations where it's gone longer, six to 12 months, mm -hmm. uh, where somebody um, can get back on track and they can be set up to be successful. And there's, you have to change your working relationship with them. You have to potentially change some of the dynamics in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, who they're working with. Uh, we've had incredible success uh, getting somebody back on track. Um, but there are a lot of situations where it just wasn't meant to be. Someone was capable of adding value at a different time in the organization's maturation, and for whatever reason, um, they're not growing with the role, and so you have to make that change. So we're going to start soon with questions, but there's one. let's go back to the beginning. So it's been 10 years since you've taken the job as CEO, and a lot of founders out there, I imagine, are hesitant to hand over the CEO role because they're worried about their legacy being erased from the company or someone else you know, really driving the ball forward. That hasn't happened with you and Reed. So maybe talk to us a little bit about what's Reed's role in the company still today and how did that evolve over the 10 years, last 10 years? Yeah, so uh, Reed recognized fairly early on that he didn't want to be in that operating role day in and day out. So I think it starts there with uh, self-awareness and recognition of what as a founder you want to accomplish. And to the extent uh, that decision is being more driven by ego than it is by real interest, I think that's in, some, in, in part where some people get into trouble. Uh, you, you kind of couched it as um, their legacy and thinking about their legacy as opposed to the company's success. Right. So I think aligning those two things are really important as a founder. And by the way, they are aligned, right? right. The founder's legacy to a large extent will be tied to the overall success of the company. Uh, Reed had other interests. I think Reed recognized that um, where he could add the most value uh, was in terms of strategy, in terms of a uh, longer term vision, and that definitely played uh, not only to his strengths, but his passions. He also was interested and was already a legendary angel investor in the Valley and was interested in doing that on a more full-time uh, basis. So ended up becoming a partner at another venture capital firm. Oh, there we go. And- Took 27 minutes to figure that out. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned at the onset, uh, what was a little bit unusual about our situation was by virtue of my admiration and respect for Reed, I didn't join LinkedIn in spite of Reed. I joined LinkedIn in part because of Reed. And when he had mentioned to me he was gonna be transitioning uh, to become a partner, I said that's fine as long as he was gonna stick around and as long as he would and be And he was there. chairman all the way through the acquisition. Chairman, he was chairman all the way through the acquisition. Uh, we set it up as dual class. Um, he was, uh, he was an incredible mentor to me. 
Uh, he was an advisor, he's become one of my closest friends, and despite the fact he was chairman of the board, if he wasn't, just knowing what he's capable of, of contributing, he would have been the first person I would have asked to join our board. But that's critical. The CEO coming and joining because, in part because of the founder, not in spite of the founder. So well, and important. the founder's self-awareness, where their skills are. Yeah, and his, his is off the charts, right. um, but it's, uh, it's a great model. Great. Well, there's a hundred or so CEOs in the audience. So I want to make sure they have the opportunity to ask you questions. So if you could raise your hand, the mic will come around. Amen. Hi, Jeff. Martin here. Um, hi. Uh, hi. hi. I just wanted to ask you, how did LinkedIn manage, you know, the, the other day when Zuckerberg was in Congress, you know, trying to explain uh, how Facebook works and, and the Russians interfere in the election and all these issues, but LinkedIn is never, you manage to keep the company away from any of those issues. Partly, I think it's because of the nature of the platform, but in the politics that's around these platforms, I was wondering how you've been so able to keep LinkedIn out of any noticeable problem. Is there wood around here? <laughs> it's not wood, is it? We'll knock for you. For Micah. Uh, I think in part our uh, government relations strategy benefits from the fact that uh, what we're trying to accomplish in terms of the vision of the company to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce uh, and the way in which we, we will execute that and manifest that is through the development of what we call the economic graph uh, which maps, digitally maps the global economy or can map an economy within any given locality is something that all uh, government leaders. It's something that all uh, countries, cities, towns can benefit from. Everyone wants to create economic opportunity regardless of your politics. The way in which you go about that may change from country to country and from political system to political system, but we're all aligned around that. And from a very early uh, period in the company's uh, evolution, uh, we made clear we were going to try to operationalize that vision and bring it to reality and partner, uh, partner with uh, governments, partner with uh, educational organizations, partner with NGOs, nonprofits, and of course, working with our customers and our members. And I think that's helped a lot to have that kind of alignment and for that alignment to be so core and fundamental to what we do uh, has certainly made a difference. Naveen. Uh, Jeff, I uh, obviously love everything you have done, and I'm wondering, now is this the time for you to do something, another meaningful thing in life Correct. to make maybe <laughs> illness optional? I have a dream job. Uh, I can't, for, for my interests, um, my own personal vision, uh, which I kind of defined uh, prior to joining LinkedIn, just prior, uh, is to help expand the world's collective wisdom and compassion. And I can't think of a better position to do that from. You know, I was, it started when I was much younger. I was very interested in education reform and have always had at least one foot in the world of education, typically through nonprofits like Donors Choose. I'm on the board of DonorsChoose.org uh, and do some other work. Uh, I'm working with a company called EverFi right now to ensure that compassion is taught in every primary school in the United States, which we're really excited about. It wasn't until I got to LinkedIn that I realized that you could. Uh, you could invest all of your time and energy in moving the needle in terms of education reform, but if you're not creating access to economic opportunity, it's only one half of the, the solution. You need both. Uh, they're, they're completely integrated. And so I just can't imagine a, a better place uh, to be working uh, in terms of not only the realization of what I'd like to uh, contribute to, but in terms of what the company has set out to do, in terms of creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, you think about uh, the times we live in and uh, the fact that socioeconomic stratification is hovering at historic highs in a number of different regions of the world and the consequences to society, if that's not resolved and that gap doesn't start to, to narrow. And I think it's one of the most pressing issues of our time and to have the opportunity to work on that as a, a, a challenge and try to contribute towards that. And then the people I get a chance to work with at LinkedIn, are, they're extraordinary. I mean, they're not only just incredibly talented, but they're good people. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. 
Yeah, Jeff, you talked a lot about the great relationship you had with Reed, um, but you also mentioned that Reed wanted you to make the decisions. I'm sure there were times where you made a decision that Reed might have disagreed with or those kinds of things. How did you handle those kinds of situations and um, what became of them? So in all honesty, uh, we essentially didn't materially disagree on anything of consequence uh, for basically my entire tenure. The only time, so there was no major strategic decision. There was no major uh, product call uh, where there was uh, a significant disagreement. He, Reed, always set me up to be successful insofar as he would say it's ultimately going to be your decision because of how incredibly talented and, and smart Reed is. I was always interested in his opinions on some of those bigger decisions. Uh, Reed contributed to uh, specific product teams through product reviews, and, and he'd meet with folks outside of our standard meetings uh, to be able to uh, contribute in that way. Uh, where we did disagree every once in a while uh, was on uh, some talent issues. Reed is an extraordinarily loyal person. And uh, there was, you know, there might have been a few examples where there were some disagreements along those lines. And uh, we didn't necessarily see eye to eye, but uh, eventually, uh, like I said, Reed would, would be really good about uh, setting me up to be successful in those situations. Maybe one last question, Vivek. Um, you talked about uh, writing down the vision, the values, and codifying it. Um, but probably it's really hard to operationalize and execute it at scale. Uh, can you talk to me about how you implemented it tactically, aligning the exec team, aligning your company, and how long did it take for you to feel good saying, you know what, we've made it. Mm. You can go and ask any LinkedIn employee, they'll be able to say it. For a fantastic question. So there's no one thing. It's a series of things, as you might imagine. It starts with that codification process and getting that right. And then it goes to some of the things we were talking about earlier in terms of bringing the right talent on, on board, uh, recruiting against your vision, from your vision to your values, recruiting against that, onboarding against it, developing against it, evaluating performance against it. Then there's very specific things we put in place uh, to reinforce it. Uh, I have an executive staff meeting uh, once a week for three hours. And the cadence of that meeting, what we cover, how we cover it, uh, has evolved over time. But the uh, the, the lion's share of that meeting, the substance of that meeting has remained unchanged. Our dashboards have evolved over time, uh, but we put those into place uh, from very early days. Uh, daily dashboard, uh, weekly dashboard, uh, what we measure on a quarterly basis. Uh, we have real-time capabilities as well. Uh, we do an all hands every other week. Uh, started weekly, and then as the company got larger, that lasted about nine months to a year and figured it might be best to go every other week. I've been doing a, every other week all hands for um, almost 10 years. Uh, it's now broadcast live uh, to over 30 cities around the world in which we operate, 12,000 employees. The substance and content of that, the flow of that has remained virtually unchanged in terms of reinforcing our priorities reinforcing the mission, the vision, uh, reinforcing the culture, the values. And it's become something that uh, when we do a biannual uh, employee uh, voice survey uh, in the open-ended comments section, uh, time and time again, uh, the, the team, our employees will say, don't change the all hands. It's so fundamental to our culture and their access to information. And they really value that transparency and a shared understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish and how we're trying to accomplish it, the good and the bad, by the way. Uh, we have a tendency, you know, one of our core values is to be open, honest, and constructive, not just to be transparent, but to do so in a constructive way. And it's not just at the all hands, it's also at weekly meetings. We do um, what we call a member value meeting once a week on Fridays for about an hour and a half. We go over all the ways in which we create value for members, measurable ways, and we talk about roadmap and priorities and changes we need to make. We do the same thing for the business. We have a monetization meeting every Wednesday for an hour and a half. Have been doing, we have a corp dev meeting every other week to review strategy in the competitive landscape and M&A. And it all creates a system. And I should add, and if I could do anything differently from day one, I would have started this process. We do quarterly business reviews. 
where we take, it's roughly eight meetings uh, uh, for about an hour and a half on average, depends on the business unit or the product line we're covering. Once a quarter, we get together for two days, and there's a six-page document that has been iterated on heavily. We've done now nine quarterly business reviews, so that document, we know exactly what we're looking for and how best to present the information. And uh, we review with the team in the room uh, their quarterly performance and a rolling, the, the forward 12-month look at the business. And we're looking at not only key executional performance, but also strategy. But one of the keys to this is having all of the vice presidents of the company uh, following along via video conference. And so we can open up the performance of the business on a quarterly basis, and not only that quarter, but the next year to all of the leadership. So all of these things add up and they all create an environment where we're on the same page. Great. We're out of time. Um, after this, there's a half hour break, so please come back here by 10.30 for the session after that. Let's thank Jeff for a great talk. Thank you.